So that that victory that is yours, right? When you when you are attacked, when Satan comes against you, you come from the victory. You come from the victory. If you are, if you've got symptoms coming in your body, then you come from the health of Christ because the health of Christ is imbued in you. You are filled with the health of Christ. You're the presence of God is within you. And so you are contagious with divine health. And so you're not trying to, you know, stop the, you're not trying to get this. It, you just, it has stopped. It's finished. Like Mike said, poverty, sickness, sin, physical death. It was done at the cross, but you come from the victory of Christ. You are in that finished victory. You are in that, and in that there is there are different levels. So I want to talk today about because if we want to walk in the fullness of the victory, Jesus said, I call you friends. Jesus said in John 15, 15, I call you my friends. That means that you're no longer a slave. You're no longer like sort of like, wait, master, what can I do for you? He says, I call you my friends. So as friends, they know what you're going to do, right? If I can sit down with friends, I share what's on my heart. I share dinner with them. I share heart talks with them. We know we, we discuss things. But if I'm serving an employer or I'm serving someone as a master, that's a completely different relationship. And Jesus said in John 15, 15, I call you my friends. You're no longer my servants. I call you my friends. Now, the interesting thing with that is that friendship is double-sided. I can call somebody my friend, but whether or not they actually reciprocate friendship to me is a different thing, right? So I can call somebody my friend. Oh, yeah, I know them really well. They're my friend. But... Their attitude to me might not be what I think it is. And so we've got to understand that you are, you are established in the victory of Christ. You're established in him, right? You are dead. Like, let's face it, we're all dead, but we're, we're alive in him. He's alive in us. So the thing is, if I'm his friend, I've got to know how to be friendly with Jesus. And I can remember years ago, I would be saying to Jesus, oh, I love you, I love you, I love you. I love you. I love you, you know. <laughs> but he said to me one day, he said, you can tell me that as much as you like. He said, but if your actions don't line up with your words, they're just words. Because if you love me, you obey me. And it's not a thing of works. It's being established in a friendship with Jesus. You know, when you love somebody, you want to do things that please them. If you know you've got somebody coming for dinner and they're really good friends, you know what they like to eat. You want to make sure that it's, you know, it, you serve them what they, they like because they're your friends. Or I've got a friend who hates green, like just detests green. I love green. So you know who I'm talking about, right? So when I'm with that person, I don't wear green. Because I know that I'm going to get the whole time, oh, I hate green. I really can't stand. Why, why do you wear green? So I think I love them. I don't need to go into that conversation. I won't wear green when I'm with that person. I love green, though. I love green. But, you know, but that's what we do. When you love somebody, don't you, don't you sort of like make allowances for them? And we, we go out of our way to please them because we love them. So that we can, we can know people in different ways. Jesus said, I call you my friend. But do you know how hard it is to sit with Jesus when you first start off in a friendship and not ask for something? Like, and what do you say, uh, Master of the Universe, how's your day going? When he's, you know, like he's totally defeated everything, he's totally victorious. Hey, you know, have you had a good day? Well, he's sort of like, well, what other kind of a day is there, you know, in heaven? You know, like... It's a completely different conversation when you start off and say, Jesus, I want to be your friend. I truly want to be your friend, but I'm not quite sure what that looks like from my angle. I don't want to ask you for anything. I just want to really get to know you. I can't ask you about the, did you watch the footy on Friday? Like, I mean, can I ask you about what you thought of the game? Like, I mean, what do you ask him? Like, how do you, how do you get, grow into, it's a process, right? It's a process. Like any relationship, it's a process. So if you think about the people that followed Jesus, there was the enemy, there were the Romans, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the religious, Herod, right? Not impressed. 
don't want to know about him, except he's a pain. We're just going to need to do something about him. But they were the enemy. Then you had the crowd who followed Jesus maybe because of curiosity. They followed Jesus maybe because they'd heard that he'd fed, you know, a whole bunch of people with some food. So like, oh, I'm in for a free feed. Or maybe they wanted to see the miracles. Maybe they needed a miracle. So you've got a whole bunch of people following Jesus for a whole different sort of reasons. Then out of the crowd, he draws 70. And he says in Luke chapter 10, I think it is, verse 1, and he said, I want you to go ahead of me, go two by two, and I want you to go into the towns before I get there and prepare them for my coming. So out of the crowd, he discerns 70, two by two, go ahead of me. Out of the crowd, he discerns another 12. Only these don't go ahead of him, they go with him. Different relationship. So Jesus doesn't have favorites like we think. Because everything with Jesus is, what do you call it, cardionosis, heart relationship, heart to heart. So he has the 12, and they're his disciples, and they become his apostles. And then he says, I've given you the authority, you go and do everything that I do. So he gives them the same ministry. They walk with him. They talk with him. He gets frustrated with them. That's a real friendship when you can actually say, how long have I got to put up with you dense guys? You know, like seriously, how much unbelief is there in you? So, you know, there's, but it's a real honest relationship. So there's the 12, but then out of the 12, there's three, Peter, James, and John. And those three were with him on the Mount of Transfiguration. Those three were with him when he raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. On particular occasions, he took those three with him on specific assignments. It wasn't, I think, that they were any greater or, or better than the others. I think it was just that they were building a deeper relationship than the others. And then out of those three, there's one, John. And John's the one who leaned his breast on Jesus's head on Jesus's breast the other way around J John leaned across because they don't sit at the table at chairs at a table they kind of recline recline so much easier in tongues they recline around the table and so Peter wanted to ask a question because Jesus is saying somebody at the table is going to betray me so Peter leans across to John who's leaning against Jesus and he said ask him ask him because they knew that John had a relationship with Jesus that they didn't. John had a cardiognosis, a heart relationship that went deeper with Jesus than the others. It wasn't that he was any better, any greater, any brighter. It was just that he had abandoned himself to loving Jesus. And remember, John was the one that they couldn't kill. They had um, boiled him in oil, couldn't kill him, chucked him on an island. He wrote the book of Revelation. I mean, what do you do with a man like that? And I think he lived to be, what, about 100 or something? He lived a long time because, honestly, he wasn't, he just wasn't conducive to death. <laughs> <laughs> but he was the one who had a relationship, although he did say, he wrote it, he wrote it in his own gospel that Jesus loved him more than the others. So we know if you have to say that, he's sort of like, oh, really? But he was the one who put his head, you know, like he reclined against Jesus. He was the one. And we all have that opportunity to be the one. So we can decide whether we're going to stay with the crowd. Or do we want to be part of the 70? 
or do we want to be part of the 12? You think, you know what, the three look pretty good. But I want to be the one. And I want this house to be the one. So we have an opportunity. So all of us, every one of us, if you look at who followed Jesus, the 70, the 12, they, you know, when, when he did the, the completed work, the finished work at Colossians 2.15, when Satan was thoroughly defeated and publicly made a spectacle of, um, every, every one of the disciples was a part of that. Interesting. This is just a little rabbit trail. Interesting that after he rose from the dead in the book of John, there were only 10 apostles that he appeared to. Judas was dead. Thomas was missing in action. 10. The same number Abraham said for Sodom and Gomorrah. But what if there's 10? And later on, there were the, you know, Thomas came in and then they appointed somebody to take Judas's place. So on the day of Pentecost, there were 12. But it was interesting that when he appeared after he rose from the dead, it was to 10. But we have the opportunity to be, as Mike said, you are in Christ. As Joy said, you know, he's interested in our desires, radically revolutionary. He, he, there's a freedom that comes from knowing Jesus. There is a freedom. There's a celebration when Satan's got one plan for your life like he had with Leah and God intervenes and says, no, you know what? My daughter's going to live. Like he said that with all of us, you know, in different things we've been through, different things he's rescued us from. Satan's had one plan. But our Father, through Jesus Christ, who totally defeated the enemy by the power of the Holy Spirit, has a different plan. And so for us to stand back and be a part of the 70, or for us to stand back and be a part of the 12, or even to be a part of the three, when we know what Jesus has done for us, we need to step up and say, I want to be the one. I want to be the one. I want to be the one. I want this house to be the one. I want to be that close to Jesus that I can just snuggle and, and, and lean upon him and be able to ask him questions that nobody else wants to ask. Because even Peter, who was one of the three, said, will you ask him? So in that, in that favoured position, you can ask questions that no one else can. You are privy to, to secrets from the kingdom that no one else will be privy to <coughs> when you're that one. And it's progressive. Like it didn't happen for John overnight. Remember, he and James had a big blue because they wanted to be seated with Christ and, you know, and the mother came and the whole thing, the whole Jewish mother bit. But, you know, so we've got this whole thing happening, relationships, and Jesus loves relationships. That's what he came to sort out, relationships, because that was what God had in the Garden of Eden was a relationship, and it got messed up. And so he came back to establish us in a relationship. But we decide how close we're going to go. Jesus said, I no longer call you slaves, you're my friends. So he's opened the door. He said, you can come as close to me as you want, but the choice is ours. The choice is ours. And it's not about works. It's not about spending three hours in prayer and 40 days of fasting. It's not about any of that. It is a heart inclination that we recognize that love is the key. And we, Mike talked about faith. Well, let's get one thing understood right now. Faith will not work without love. Faith only works by love, and that is the great commandment. Love God, love people, love yourself. And out of that love will flow the Great Commission, the going off to India, Pakistan, the going to the corner shop and leading someone to the Lord. But it has to come out of love because God is love. And so the closer we get to Jesus, the, the more the manifestation of the love of God. Because in John chapter 1, verse 18, it says that Jesus came out of the bosom of the Father. That means that he is the very heart of God, exposed and expressed for us to, to live, to know and to understand. He's the very heart of God. 
the heart of the Father. And we have an opportunity to get as close to him as we choose. Jesus is not the one who says, you can, Suzette, you can come this far, but I don't want you any closer. He says that the door is open. You can come into that throne room anytime you want. I'm your Abba Daddy. You can speak to me anytime you want, 24-7. I am available to you. I am here to listen to you, to love you, to walk with you, to work with you, to, to sort things out with you. I am your Redeemer, your Saviour, your Deliverer, but more than anything else, I'm your Father. And I want, I want, he wants the best for you. That's what love is, wanting the best for people. But you have an opportunity to get rid of the layers and the veils that are on our mind, that are layers, layers of veils of, you know, like, well, who am I? Who do I think I am? What do I think, you know? All of the things that we tag ourselves with. I shared on Wednesday night I was having a great time with God. I'm, you know, spirit to spirit, heart to heart. And he was actually saying to me, Suzette, I delight in you. And I'm going, oh, you know, my heart's just melting and I'm journaling it out. And then all of a sudden my mind comes in with, oh, seriously, you really think that's God speaking to you? And it was like, oh. So it took me to say, yes, you know, but how quick the soul comes in to say, get back to where I want you tagged. Get back to where you belong. So I'm telling you right now, your soul is not to, not to come up and to tell you anything. You are a spirit being first and foremost, and your soul is in submission to your spirit, and that's how we live. And your soul will tell you lies. Your soul will tell you that this you feel rejected, abandoned, frustrated, all of that stuff. But if it's the unrenewed part of your soul, it if it's your unrenewed mind, it is lies. It is not truth. Because the promises of God is the truth of God. Come on. Jesus is the truth. If God says, you are the apple of his eye, you are the apple of his eye. And how you feel about yourself and what you think of yourself is really secondary because the Father said, but you're the apple of my eye. You're my salt and you're my light. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. Come on. You are my joy. You are my child. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You've been set free from the law of sin and death. Yes. The spirit of resurrection, life and power now lives within you and brings health and wholeness to your body. You've been vindicated. You've been justified. You are sanctified. Jesus Christ is your righteousness. You are wisdom. You are his wisdom walking on the earth. You are fathered by God. Born again because he desired it to be so. You weren't born because man and woman got together. They're natural. They did. But you were born because the Father wanted you born. You're not an accident. You were deliberately chosen by God. So we have a, an opportunity to step out of abandonment. We have an opportunity to step out of rejection. We have an opportunity to step, step out of the lies that we tell ourselves, the tags that we put on ourselves. We have an opportunity to step out of these things and step into the finished, completed work of Jesus Christ, where Satan is under your feet for eternity. Every step you take, you, you step on his head. He is finished. He's done. He's finished, vanquished, the eternal loser, the eternal loser. 
But you, you are seated with Christ in heavenly places. You walk in the Abrahamic blessing. You have the blessing of the Lord that makes rich and he adds no sorrow with it. You've also been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You've been given everything you need for life and for godliness. You've been given divine health, divine victory. You've been given the faith. Jesus Christ himself is your faith. Like honestly, you lack nothing. You live in divine health, but the body will tell you, oh, you know, I think I did something to my back or oh you know at my age you can expect a few creaks and groans and moans and all that kind of stuff that's all rubbish because the lord renews your youth that's the truth I tell my body, uh 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 no old age aches and cracks for you babe because the lord is renewing your youth I wait upon the Lord and he strengthens me. You've got to come back with the truth. In this, and the truth comes. When it becomes revelation, that's when it's released from the pit of your belly with an anointing upon it that destroys everything that comes against you. Sometimes you've been meditating on the word of God, but it's still a memory thing. It, you've changed. You, it's, it's here, but it's not here. But when it comes out of your belly, when it comes out with those rivers of living water, when it comes out with that two-edged sword, when it comes out with that, that's when the enemy runs because that's the power of the anointing that destroys what comes against you. It's not when it comes out of your head. It's not when it comes out of your thoughts. It's when it comes out of that belly. Out of your belly flows rivers of living water, rivers of living water, not trickles, not little drips and pieces, but rivers of living water. So whatever it is that's dammed up that river of, on the inside of you, whether it's an offense, whether it's a con condemnation whatever it might be get rid of the stones that are, are blocking those rivers from flowing because out of your belly flows rivers of living water rivers of living water rivers of living water it flows everywhere it flows out of you it flows into the situations you enter into it flows into the people that come with you it touches people as you go but sometimes we block it up because we think well who am I and what's God going to do? And I'm a bit worried about this. And so we've got these stones, these things that block the rivers. We dam it up with negative emotions. We dam it up with lies that we believe. We dam it up. And God is saying, get rid of that now in Jesus' name. Come back to the truth of who you are in Christ. Come back to who you are in Christ. Come back to the victory that he's already given you. Come back to the divine health that he's given you. Come back to the divine prosperity prosperity that he's laid upon you. He destroyed poverty at the cross. Sickness and disease and death were destroyed at the cross. The power of the curse destroyed at the cross. Come on. You are redeemed, separated, set apart, sanctified, set on high. Set on high. Why should you come down and entertain the thoughts of the enemy? Why should you step down? Why should you abdicate your place? You don't leave the place. You're seated with him in heavenly places. And we carry a lot of junk from the past. Can I just say that? We carry a heap of junk. You know, when you go on a travel, like my, my biggest problem is I'm not into clothes, but I love books. <laughs> so if I travel, I think, well, I need this book. Oh, maybe I've got time to read that book. And I think, oh, makeup, clothes, oh, oh. So I have a challenge, right? But the airline has a very strict policy. No excess baggage. No excess baggage. And if there is excess baggage, well, you can either take it out and leave it at the airport or you can pay for it. I remember years ago, one of the churches I was at, there was a young guy who was going to Russia um, for a trip. But he wasn't too sure what he was going to find over there. So, and he had all these big suitcases going to Russia. And the, the airline said, um, excess baggage, you're going to have to, you can't take all that. Like, 
we have strict, you know, it affects the fuel consumption, it affects everything. So we've got strict, strict things on what you can take. So in the middle of the airport in Brisbane, he is unpacking his suitcase of tins and tins of food, just in case there wasn't enough food in Russia. But, you know, we laugh at that and we laugh about, well, what are we going to do with it? You now we're left with the tins at the airport. He did come back with a wife. <laughs> but the question is, what excess baggage are we trying to take on your walk with Jesus? What excess baggage? that he's, you know, it's not going to do you any good. It's going to slow you down. It's going to be a bondage. It's going to cause heartache. What excess baggage are you actually taking on your trip with Jesus? And for a lot of us, like, you know, we've been Christian for a long time. So it's not like we're going out partying, nightclubs, guys or girls or anything, or drinking, hopefully. But for a lot of us, there's disappointment, disillusionment, shipwrecked faith, places where we think that we really heard God but it didn't come through. So I believe in God and I believe his promises, but can I really trust him? There's father issues. There's rejection. There's the feeling that I just can't seem to find my place. I always seem to be overlooked. Sometimes we get feelings like, I've just got to fight for every single thing I've got, not realizing that you don't have to fight at all because Jesus did it for us. We've got to learn to receive. But what are we taking? that is excess baggage. Sometimes it's just a lousy attitude. But we're meant to be light in the spirit, light in the world, light in the spirit. So there's an opportunity here today to get rid of your excess baggage. Whatever it is. Even just going to the birthday party last night, I had a negative attitude. I didn't want to go to a theme party. Whoopee. I didn't want to have to stand around and be nice to people I didn't know. Lousy attitude. And so when we shifted, I say the royal we, <laughs> Danny's, Danny's gorgeous, I'm the one with the problems. <laughs> but when we, sh when we shifted our attitude and asked Jesus to go to the party with us, it was amazing the interaction we had with people, um, people asking us to pray for them and, you know, like Hindus and, and said, would you pray? Just amazing it was. It was wonderful. But I had to dump the excess baggage or I wouldn't have walked away with any of those blessings. I, I Yes, last night with the wrong attitude, I'm not sure if I'd even have made it into the 70. <laughs> I might have been in the, on the peripherals of the crowd. <laughs> Jesus saying, I really can't use her tonight. <laughs> but the thing is, you are so much more precious and wonderful than you're aware of. Father has counted every hair on your head. 
He knows you're coming in and you're going out before you come and go. He knows you're gonna, what you're going to say and think before you think and say it. He's got a path that's laid out for you that gets brighter and brighter with the coming day. He's actually made your heart the home of the Holy Spirit. He said, I love you so much that I'm going to give you the same glory as I gave Jesus. I give you the same anointing as Jesus. And I love you as much as I love Jesus. So why do we limit ourselves? Whatever it is that is slowing you down, whatever it is that contradicts the truth of God's love and God's word to you, now is the time to ditch it. And for everyone in this room, it's different. For some, it will be fatherlessness. For some, it will be abuse. For some, it will be like almost a shipwrecked faith where you've stood and you've believed God for so long and you thought, well, he's, I'm going through the motions, but I really can't believe God. I'm going through the motions. I still believe, but I'm really struggling with expectation and anticipation. Or you just can't see how God's going to improve your life. You need your life improved. You want to know your destiny. You want to know where he's taking you. you you're willing to do anything he tells you to do, but you just can't see anything that can change. And that's a spirit of blindness that stops you from moving forward. There are 10 Hebrew words for time. Isn't that amazing? 10. 10 Hebrew words for time. Greek is just Kronos and Kairos. But there's 10 Hebrew words for time. And all of them are different things, different meanings. One of them it means that time is a seed in the hand of God. Time is a seed. Another one is a combination of two letters. One, uh, Aleph, the God, God's name, and the other is the, the letter that represents the word of God. So you've got the name and the word of God coming together to shape your time and to dig out of time what is required for you. For some of you, you feel like you're not in step with God. Like you either need to be speeded up or slowed down or moved to one side, but you're just sort of not in sync. And just try as you hard and you pray and you fast and you're in the word, but it's not about what we do, it's about what he's done. And so all of this, these, these lies, these perceptions, these manipulations of the enemy, these deceptions, digressions, diversions of the enemy have stopped the fullness of the Father's love flowing into your life and giving to you what he's had in his heart to give you. In Isaiah, let me read this out. I love this. Isaiah, this is the Amplified. And then we're going to do a bit of body ministry. Isaiah 30, verse 18. It says, and this is the Amplified, and therefore the Lord earnestly waits. He's earnestly waiting, expecting, looking, longing to be gracious to you. He's longing to be gracious to you. Therefore he lifts himself up that he can have mercy on you and show loving kindness to you. So picture the father on the throne with an arm full of parcels and goodies that he wants to give you and he's getting up out of the throne and he's looking over the balcony of heaven saying, is Janice ready for this lot yet? Is Janice ready for this? Oh, I can, oh, oh, yeah, oh my, oh my 
Ghost. You know, but he's anticipating the release of what he wants to give you. He's anticipating the release of it in your life. It's like when Jesus said to Peter, throw out the net. And they had this huge, you know, net breaking, boat sinking load of fish. Can you imagine the expectation in, Pe in, in Jesus? And he's looking at Peter, waiting to see the look on Peter's face. When all of a sudden these fish are up, looking to see what, you know, the, the, oh my gosh, you know, the excitement that Jesus had because it's more blessed to give than to receive. And the father's up there with an armful of presents and goodies for all of us. And he's saying, I want to, I, I just want to give it to you. And the verse finishes with blessed, happy, fortunate, and to be envied are all those who earnestly wait for him. Now that waiting for him doesn't mean I'm waiting. It means that we wrap ourselves around him, deepen our relationship, and we expect and look and long for him, for his victory, his favour, his love, his peace, his joy, and his matchless, unbroken companionship. What scripture was that? Isaiah 30, verse 18. That was the amplified, that was the novel version. But the Father's heart is longing to release. Challenge is, if we've got excess baggage, we block it. Can you sense the anointing here now? You sense that, that the Father is wanting to release. So I want you to get communion. Lynn? Hmm. Yep, come on out. I'm um, in, in praise and worship. I, um, I saw Jesus calling us, and he had his, his sash on. So um, Jesus calling us to go with him. He had a royal sash on. Jesus holding a bunch of flowers, Rose of Sharon. He had his sash on. John rested his head on Jesus' right shoulder or on his side. I also saw gentle waters, and they were deep, and it was like, we should be going deeper in him. Your sins are hidden in me, he said. Take me into, sorry, this is, take me into your holy place, in the secret place with you, going deeper. Then he showed me, um, while Mike was speaking, it, it prompted into my spirit. Slavery is this world like Egypt, we are set free in his presence, in his kingdom. So we're not to go back to Egypt. Amen. So this freedom belongs to us. Did you have something? No. Okay. I just saw Danny waving a hand at the back and I saw you moving and I thought, I'm missing, I'm missing stuff. Okay. <clears throat> You have a choice of how close you go to Jesus. 70, 12, 3, 1. Progression doesn't happen overnight, but you have a choice. God does not decide how close you come to him. You do. And the Father has bundles of stuff because if you remember how good God is, the blessings for the righteous go for a thousand generations. So a thousand generations back, blessings have been stored up for us with our name on it. On. Thousand generations back, I agree. stored up with our name on it, released incrementally into our lives as the season and the time dictates. A thousand generations. He is so absolutely 
generous 